very much indeed. And um, I was half tempted to ask Stephen Hawking if he wanted to put a bet on the outcome of this discussion, but it sounds like he might have lost enough money recently anyway on the Nobel Prize. Anyway, I think it should be a fascinating discussion. Um, my um, first guest is Nima Akani Hamid, uh, one of the world's most um, exciting and interesting theoretical physicists from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He's also an avid reader. He particularly likes the work of Alice Munro, and luckily enough for today, also the novels of Ian McEwan. <laughs> um, Ian, as I'm sure you all know, is one of our uh, best loved, most successful novelists, both getting critical acclaim and mass readership as well, which isn't um, always the case. He's very interested in, in the subject of our discussion um, today, and he said himself that um, something is missing in our culture. We overvalue the arts in relation to the sciences. And it's at that point that I wanted to start off, before we move on to what similarities there might be, but to this um, perceived gulf. And I was wondering, Ian, whether you could describe for us how you think this manifests itself. Well, that old two-culture matter, I think, is still with us. I mean, ever since Snow promulgated it back in the, in the 50s, it still is possible to be a flourishing public intellectual uh, with absolutely no reference to science. It's, it still can go on, but it's happening less and less. And I think it's less a change of any decision uh, in the culture at large, just a, a social reality pressing in on us. Uh, it was touched on just briefly uh, earlier this evening that uh, bioethics is now a, a, a critical matter. We all carry around with us miraculous tiny machines that involve at least some passing admiration for the, for the engineering that created them. Um, and it's true also you know, climate change forces us to, those of us who have no interest in science, to, to at least get a smattering of some idea of, of, of what it is to predict uh, systems that have more than you know, two or three variables and whether this is even possible. Nima, you've expressed frustration at people in intellectual circles who have no knowledge of science. Well, it's, it's an asymmetry that doesn't really need to exist. Uh, um, uh, certainly, many scientists are very appreciative of the arts. Uh, uh, Many, many of my colleagues are very fine musicians, uh, that, there's, that there's, there's tremendous aesthetic appreciation uh, for, for, for the arts. The essential gulf is one of language, obviously, um, and especially for uh, our part of uh, physics, and especially in theoretical physics, the basic uh, difficulty is that most people don't understand our language of mathematics, with which we, uh, with, which we use to describe everything we know. Uh, about the universe, um, and so while I'm capable of uh, uh, of, of uh, listening to and intensely enjoying a Beethoven sonata or an Ian McEwan novel, um, and can attest for myself that uh, Ian's a spectacular novelist, uh, it can be more difficult for uh, people in the arts to have some appreciation for what we do, and um, it might be harder. For, so Ian may have to take on on uh, someone else's authority that I'm a decent theoretical physicist. <laughs> uh, and so that's, uh, that's, I think, part of the origin of the, uh, part of the, origin of the uh, asymmetry. I really want to ask Nemo whether he thinks time is real. Uh, would it return us? Could we then enter the, the fold of theoretical physics if you to assure us that although you might want to abolish space-time, we could say the universe has been getting more and more complex it can only do this through time. Perhaps time is real, not just a function of um, consciousness or... Well, certainly in, 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 in every practical, and uh, we can have a long discussion about what the, world, what the word real means, but... but time. But, <laughs> that'll keep us going for a couple of hours. But, but that's, uh, that's uh, anyway, discussing what, what, what real means is probably not, not a very interesting thing to do anyway. It's, uh, the universe uh, has been getting more interesting, is uh, that right? That's, that's certainly true. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's getting more, more complex and more interesting. And so in, in every, in, uh, so time is obviously a very useful idea, obviously. It, it, uh, uh, I forget who it was without, uh, who said, you know, if we didn't have time, everything would happen at once. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so time certainly exists. Uh, of course, there is, time does exist as a useful concept, as an organizing concept, 
Um, but many of us do suspect that, uh, that space and with it time uh, can't be fundamental. It must somehow emerge from uh, something else. You see the great commonality of, of beauty between art and science. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, so here I'm, I'm saying uh, uh, things that are said uh, much more masterfully by, by Weinberg in, dreams, dreams of the, uh, in, this, in this book. I encourage you all to read uh, Dreams, Dreams of the Final Theory. Um, but uh, we, we often talk, uh, especially in, 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 in theoretical physics and, and mathematics, of, of the idea of, of beauty in theories. And I, and I think if this is interpreted loosely, you won't get really a sense of what, what, what we mean. We have to be a little more specific when, when, when we talk about it. Uh, ideas that we find beautiful, theories that we find beautiful, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a capricious aesthetic judgment. Uh, it's not fashion, it's not sociology. Uh, it's not something that you might find beautiful today, but won't find beautiful uh, 10 years from now. Or people might not have found beautiful if it was properly explained to them 50 years ago. Um, the things that we find beautiful today, well, we suspect to be beautiful for all eternity. And, uh, and the reason is what, what we mean by beauty is really a shorthand for something else. Uh, the laws that we find that describe nature somehow uh, have a sense of inevitability about them. Uh, there's very few principles, very, very few principles, and there's no possible other way they could work once you understand them deeply enough. I'm aware that I haven't really asked you, in very much about the influence of science on your own work. I mean, clearly you're reading widely for its own sake because you're engaged and interested, but it has influenced some of you, I mean, particularly solar, I, I, I'd suggest. Well, it has, but um, it, it's, I think novelists are lucky that they can... You know, sitting down to write a novel is roughly about the time of an undergraduate university course. You know, and you might draw on uh, the work of a historian, you might need uh, to read a biography of a composer, or you might... In other words, I, I, I would like to feel that we could think about science as just one more aspect of organized human curiosity rather than as a special mm. compartment. And it has, as uh, it's been very clear, I think, from this discussion, a, a powerful aesthetic. Um, it also has, you know, wonderful human clashes and, and all the rest of it, as does every other uh, human field. But I think we need to generalize it. We need to absorb it into our sense that we can love uh, the music of Beethoven without being composers, uh, without being musicians. And we could love science as a celebration of human ingenuity without uh, being scientists or mathemat mathematicians. It has had a huge effect on my own sense of the world. It certainly has uh, helped me along the way to a, a general uh, embracing global skepticism about religion. I don't think these are two distinct uh, magisteria. I think they're entirely opposed. Uh, the world of faith is, I think, inimical to, to the world of science. Uh, and in that sense, uh, science has helped me uh, want to write books every now and then which are in celebration of, of um, a, a full-blooded rationalism. It's one of our... Uh, delightful aspects and it informs uh, what we try to do with our laws and our legislations and our social policy. We don't succeed uh, a lot of the time. It's very hard to, to make human institutions that are irrational, but the impulse is powerfully there and we uh, despair of human relationships at the very most private level when they're irregular or contradictory. We, we demand even of our lovers a degree of coherence. Uh, and behind that lies a notion of consistency and, and rationality. So uh, science music is, is one case of, of that. Uh, and the, the novel I wrote, um, Enduring Love, was actually a, a novel in wishing to oppose uh, the romantic notion that uh, abstraction and logic and rationality, and science in, in particular, uh, was a cold-hearted thing, a myth, I think, which began with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, we, need, we need to reclaim our, our own sense of, 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 of the full-bloodedness, of the warmth, really, of what's rational. Celebration of the rational, a final word from you, Nima. I'm sure that's something you'd agree with. He said it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fantastic.
fantastic. Well, look, uh, we are we really have uh, kind of overrun our time, but it was such an interesting discussion. So I want to um, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you very much to the audience for. I hope you enjoyed our I think, our brief history of beauty, art, truth, and indeed time. Thank you very much indeed to both of my guests. Thank you very much. <laughs>